It should go without saying that the life of an ancient Egyptian soldier was rough. But most of the time, soldier was not your life's path, the way labouring or scribing or kinging would be. Warfare in ancient Egypt was seasonal, with soldiers conscripted from among the labouring population for a specific purpose, and the troops were disbanded when that campaign ended. But in the New Kingdom, professional soldiers had started to become a thing, because the New Kingdom was born out of rebellion, a war that lasted for generations. One career soldier was called Armos, and we know about his life because he became respected enough to have a tomb of his own. And this tomb, located near the ancient city of Netheb, features an autobiography focusing on Armos' military career. I want to start by looking at Armos' life so we can get an idea of how a military career could have gone well, and then we can peel back the glorification to see the brutal truth underlying it. First off, my thanks to Mark Jan Nederhoff of St Andrews University and the large collection of ancient Egyptian texts encoded with software of his own design, hosted on the St Andrews website. I'll share a link to the repository in the description. I used his version of the hieroglyphs rather than creating my own, because time is linear, and my share of it is finite. Armos began his career as what I guess we'd call a marine in the navy of King Sekinenre. His father had been a soldier called Baba, but interestingly his tomb introduces him as the son of Ebana, so maybe his mother was higher in social standing. Right away we see that Almos and Baba were both career soldiers, and this is because of the times they lived in. Second Enre was the ruler of Thebes, but contrary to Armos's claims, he never really was the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, because Lower Egypt was ruled by the Hyksos, and the Theban dynasty led Egypt's rebellion against their rule. Armos not only fought for Second Enre, but both of his sons, including another Armos who of course eventually won the war against the Hyksos and founded the New Kingdom, and he would then go on to fight under both Amenhotep and Thutmose I. Armos did well for himself, not only earning honours in battle, but being rewarded with captive slaves and even a farming estate of his own. Here he says, I've been rewarded with gold seven times, with male and female slaves, and endowed with many fields. Over the course of the rest of the war against the Hyksos, he served in the ships Wild Bull, Northern, and Rise of Memphis. It's at the battle outside Avaris where Armos tells us he captured enemies and removed a hand. This is not a metaphor. We know that one of the tasks an Egyptian soldier could be rewarded for was chopping off the weapon hand of an enemy, and we can see here from a later scene at Medinet Habu, a military scribe taking stock of the hands taken in combat. Armos tells us he was given the gold of valour, so clearly this was something the Egyptian soldiers were being richly rewarded for doing. He also captured men and women as riches, and was subsequently awarded those people as his personal chattels. Armos's career after this seemed to consist of joining the various royal campaigns of retributive genocide, first against the tribes of Asia, then Nubian nomads where he says his majesty carried out a large massacre among them. At this point, of course, his majesty refers to Armos I, who reigned for a while and spent much of that reign chastising Egypt's neighbours to establish the dominance of the newly united two kingdoms. It is by Armos I that Armos the soldier was given land of his own as a gift for his service and valour, a kindness apparently doled out to all of the crew of the ship. Armos returned to Nubia under Amenhotep I, this time as part of a campaign of territorial expansion. He did so well under Amenhotep that he was made warrior-in-chief, I guess captain? He would further be promoted under Thutmose the I to naval commander, and help the pharaoh conduct what he calls an act of massacre against southern rebels. He went with Thutmose to war against Mitanni, which the Egyptians called Naharin, and it was in this campaign that Thutmose I would reach the Euphrates, the first time an Egyptian had ever seen a river that flowed opposite the Nile. Following this service, when they returned to Egypt at last, our warrior Armos was rewarded with even more land, more than ten times the initial acreage he'd been given by Armos I. Okay, now it's clear that Armos did well for himself, as his autobiography concludes that age has caught up with him and he is an old man. So yeah, as soldiers' careers go, Armos did amazingly well, but already we've seen that he hasn't held back on the brutality of warfare. The dismemberment and enslavement of enemies was a fate that could equally befall the Egyptian. And look how extensively he travelled, how many campaigns these early New Kingdom pharaohs embarked on, as well as the mortal danger, there was an immortal one. 
If you were a common soldier and died outside of Egypt, you'd be buried far from home, away from the Nile which was the conduit that brought your spirit to its eternal reward. Death outside of Egypt meant your soul becoming lost forever, a fate quite literally worse than death. And long marches had another side effect, malnutrition. Soldiers' rations were very basic, and on extended campaigns troops were responsible for foraging if they wanted to be well fed. Marching across a desert could be lethal, even if nobody was trying to kill you on your way. In battle, any wound could have proven fatal, no matter how well cleaned. Without antiseptics it could become infected, and without antibiotics, that's a horrible way to die. And of course, in training, soldiers were disciplined with corporal punishment. As a career warrior, Armos would have both received and inflicted such horrific treatment. There are people who might read his story as inspirational, but I see it as a tale of caution. Armos boasts of his skill and bravery, and maybe he was lacking in neither of those things, but I'd say his defining trait was luck. And any soldier, even to this day, will probably attest that, in the end, whether you're fighting with blades, bullets or bombs, it's luck that will get you home safe, or see you buried anonymously in a far-off desert. Thanks for stopping by once more. I hope these slices of everyday life are proving interesting. There are quite a few more ancient Egyptian occupations I could cover, so let me know in the comments if there's anything you're particularly curious about. In the meantime, why don't you brutally chastise the like button? The military scribes who patiently reward my acts of valour are my backers at patreon.com slash armchairegypt. My thanks to them as always, and until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.